in a bridal college, sorry, bridal college. And the bridal college is in Singapore. So I come from India to study in Singapore. She comes from Sydney to study in Singapore. On the 16th day after we met, she proposed to me and I said yes. And we have now been married for the past 23 years and I'm thankful to the Lord. Shall we give the Lord a clap up? Hallelujah. I, I have two boys and we call them Chindians. You get the connection. It's a United Nations, Chinese and Indian together. Chindian. We create a new race. David is 21 and Adam is 18 today. Wow. So about two adults. David just started work and Adam is about to go to university. So thankful to the Lord for the privilege that we are able to serve the Lord together in Australia as a family and build an intentional discipling the church. The topic that has been given to me today is barriers to love, conquering barriers to love. I want to take you to an Old Testament prophet by the name of Jonah. And I want to look at his life and make some observations and make some conclusions regarding barriers to love. The reason why I want to study this, you read chapter 2, no, Jonah went into the depths of the ocean. He saw the roots of mountains and then finally seaweed wrapped around him. He became a sushi. And then the fish came and swallowed him up. The Bible says in the belly of the fish, on the third day, he started to repent, he prayed. When my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with my voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Here he says, Lord, I will do what you have asked me to do. I will do it. In other words, now, there is a softer, there's a softening of his heart. You know, this is what we would call in disciple making church, a brokenness. What is brokenness? If you're taking down notes, write these three things down. Because this is the most important thing that God always builds into our life. The stripping of self-reliance, the shattering of self-will, and the softening of heart. To say, yes, Lord, I want to do your will. It's the stripping of self-reliance, the shattering of self-will, and the softening of our heart to say, Lord, I will obey you. I will do what you have asked me to do. Then the Lord commanded the fish to vomit him out. As soon as the fish vomits him out, Jonah might have thought, good thing I escaped. Now I can go back to Tashish. But right there when he wakes up, he sees a sign that says, this way to Nineveh. In other words, God has not forgotten his mission. God says to him, go back in verse in chapter 3 and verse 1. Then the Lord came, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. When the Lord saw, you know, the Bible says that God gave him a commission to go back to Nineveh. And we know the story. There was a great repentance, a glorious repentance that happened in chapter 3. You know, no preacher in the Bible or even in human history can actually boast that a whole city came to Christ because of my preaching. In fact, Jonah could have retired after this. After chapter 3, Jonah could have been sitting at home saying, I don't have to do another mission. The whole world knows that, wow, I'm the man of God. And he writes a book, How to Bring Revival. How to bring the whole city on its knees and then goes to conferences to preach. How you can do it too. I'm kidding. I want you to think about this. But the Bible says he repented. Now the fourth movement happens in Jonah's life. Chapter 3, the Bible should have ended the story of Jonah. But the Bible says the Lord added the chapter 4. Why? Because this is what we find Jonah doing. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly in chapter 4 verse 1. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, it's not what that I said yet in my country, that I made haste to flee to Tashish, for I knew that you are gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. 
In other words, he had good theology. He knew who God is. He knew the nature of God. He knew the kindness of God, the compassion of God. But yet he says in verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? You know, the amazing thing is, Jonah never replied to that question. Do you do well to be angry? Listen carefully. Why I take time to talk about this is because in chapter 1, God arrested the mind of Jonah. In other words, Jonah knew clearly the call of God in his life. In chapter 2, God got his will at the bottom of the ocean. He says, yes Lord, I will do what you ask me to do. In chapter 3, God got the body of Jonah. He took him to Nineveh. But even though God got his mind, God got his will, God got his body, yet God did not have one thing. In chapter 4, it is revealed that God never had his heart. I want you to listen to me carefully. We can go about doing the mission work. We can go about doing DG work. We can go about doing pastoral work. We can do all the work that we are called to do without ever touching our heart. Our heart doesn't need to be involved at all. But that's what God is after. So this is where I, I study this and I realize that God is interested not in my work, but in the person. And God deals with the corruption in our soul, corruption in our heart. See, you and I need to understand that the presence, that the, the moment you're born again, God gives you a new nature. And that nature should reflect the nature of God. The Bible says <laughs> that the Holy Spirit has poured up in our hearts His love. And that love should flow from us to others. But there are some things that are within us that stops us, that acts as hindrance, acts as barriers to showing that love to people around us. So when I study the book of Jonah, I read there are three barriers. I want to bring that to share with you and bring the message to a close. Not only that, I've seen these three barriers in my own life. God has given me the grace to travel with pilgrimage with many pastors, senior pastors of mega churches, large churches, small churches, all over the world. And I've seen these three barriers in the pastors that I have the privilege of walking with. I've seen this in my own congregation, there are three barriers. And I pray that you and I, we will examine in light of the scriptures what those barriers are and ask the Holy Spirit to evaluate our life. The first barrier is ethnocentricity. I want you to say this with me. Come on. Three, two, one. Ethnocentricity. What is ethnocentricity is? It is the issue of pride and prejudice versus loving without partiality. The reason why Jonah had so much issue loving Ninevites. He had so much issue obeying God fully, wholly, and surrendering to God his entire life is because of the ethnocentricity, the pride and prejudice that was still occupying in his heart. Simon Wiesenthal wrote a book called Sunflower. Simon Wiesenthal was a, is a Holocaust survivor. After he had moved away from his concentration camp, he was working as an orderly in a hospital. And one day he was called to the bedside of a dying man. This man was wrapped up in bandages. And uh, Simon Wissenthal went to see him. And this man asked him, are you a Jew? And he said, yes, I'm a Jew. And this man started crying and he said, look, I've been a Nazi soldier. I have raped women. I have murdered countless number of people. I want you as a Jew to forgive me. When that request was presented to Simon Wiesenthal, he writes that he was stunned and couldn't say a word, couldn't move for 45 seconds, and after that, he just slowly turned around and walked away from that place. And the man started to scream in agony, and he says, don't leave me in this agony. I'm dying here. I want to be forgiven. Now, I'm not sure what to make of that story, but one thing I do know is this. That you and I, if we are in the same place, we would also struggle to do the same. Why? 
because there's been hurt, there's a pain that we carry, the wounds of the past, hinders our discipleship, hinders our love. One of the things that I am thankful to the Lord is my upbringing. I grew up in a loving home in India, fourth generation Christian family and fourth generation in Christian ministry and Christian leadership. And as from young, they raised me to be a pastor. And by the age of 16, God gave me the opportunity to start preaching. At the age of 19, God gave me a heart for the pastors in the southern part of India, in my state called Tamil Nadu. As a 19 year old, I would gather the pastors and preach from morning to evening just to encourage their heart. And about 1500 pastors would gather together. Now I was doing all this and I was committing myself to full-time ministry and flowing with what God had for me. But the Lord interrupted the plan and said to me that I want to take you out of India and I'm going to bring you to another nation. So I, I came out of India and, and went to Singapore to study. And as I said to you earlier, my path crossed with a beautiful girl. And she made it her life mission to marry me. Her name was Isabel Tan back then, T-A-N, Tan. I went to Singapore and I got a permanent Tan. <laughs> now her name is Isabel J. Chandran. She's like, what man? <laughs> it's too long. But I want you to listen to me. After we met, it so happened that when she was growing up in Sydney, in a Chinese family, the only thing that the mother had said to her teenage daughter, especially to her, you can marry anyone in the world, but never marry an Indian. <laughs> so when she calls them and says, I have met the love of my life, they flew the next day to Singapore. They hopped on a plane and the mother came and stayed with us for a whole week asked me all sorts of questions and finally said this is of the Lord, I approve, but you gotta come and talk to dad. Now dad is a different character. He had been a CEO of a company in Singapore, rose up in the ranks very quickly. He provided for his family quite well. In fact, my, my wife always says that they had three nannies, one for each daughter looking after them. They travel around the world and all of that. Later on in his life, he became a pastor and he pastored and he started a church in Sydney. Now, he met me and he said to me, I don't know you from a bar of salt, so I don't know what to say. But all I know this is of the Lord's so I give you my approval. Go ahead and get married. So we got married. On the day of marriage, no, I brought him to India. And in India, he saw all the family, the ministries and everything that we do. Uh, we are as large, uh, large ministry as it can be in, and, and she saw all of that and uh, he called me in to his hotel room and he said, never expect this in Australia, okay? And also know this, the Chinese will never accept you. And the Lord laid in my heart that I'm meant to come to Sydney and meant to work with him in his church. That was the call that the Lord laid in my heart. Now he already made it clear, I don't want you there. But cut the long story short, we got married and we are now in the, in the family home. It's about 10 days before the wedding. I'll leave my miraculous stories for Sunday or another time to share all the testimonies of faith and prayer. But cutting the story short, I stayed in their house for 10 days before the wedding. And in that 10 days, every night there will be a lecture for two hours. I cry, cry, I die, die, they you. <laughs> the only thing I said to the Lord is, Lord, you call me here. Why are you bringing me and putting me here? To cut the long story short, the wedding day happened. When he gave the wedding speech, he never said, Paul, oh, I welcome you to the family. He didn't. And then, then started to go to the church. See, I was a young man and I was already serving the ministry. My heart was to serve, nothing else. 
no title, no position, no, no, in, no, no need to give me any salary. I'll just volunteer my life. But yet, while we were doing that, he came and he said, Hey, if you're in my church all the time, people are asking me questions. Why I don't use you in ministry? I want you to leave. So the first time, we had to leave. And then a year later, he came back to me and said, I made a mistake. I want you to come back. So this time he came back and he said, I will, I, will, I will use you, but I cannot pay you. I said, yes, no problem. We live by faith. We don't, we don't do crowdsourcing. We don't do when we go for work. I have dedicated my career before the Lord. And I said, Lord, if you pay, if you provide, we eat. Otherwise, we look to you. And the Lord has provided. I will share that another time. But this, this whole season, this time when he, when he brought me back, he put me on the pulpit once every two months. And then once every month, and then twice a month, and then three times a month. And I was doing three times a month that the church grew and doubled and tripled in size. Then suddenly, one day he called me into the family and said, Hey, you're becoming too popular. You're becoming too influential. So tomorrow, from this Sunday onwards, you're not on preaching roster anymore. You're going to do morning tea. That's your ministry. Cafe ministry is your ministry. And for the next three months, I was doing cafe ministry. People are scratching their head. What wrong did this boy do? You know the Chinese whispers? They just make up stories. And in fact, they made up stories. Cut the long story short. All I know is, deep down there was something there. I went to this church and I was in this church as a young man. New country, new place. But as you walk into that church, I'm sitting there in this service one Sunday, feeling very awkward because I'm new. I'm new. Just got married. New. One old auntie came and sat next to me and said, Paul, I want to talk to you. For the past few weeks, I haven't been able to sleep. I keep thinking like this. Why would Isabel ruin her life and bring shame to her family? I'm Mr. Shame. I didn't understand. I went before the Lord and said, Lord, I'm treated like a prince back home in India. Can I just go back? I'm the favorite in my household. I got so much ministry cut out for me. But the Lord...